Uh, hi, my name is Sam Anderson and I'm a sophomore in the college and I'm majoring in chemistry and anthropology and human biology. And today I'm going to be presenting on uh, Castagna sativa or the sweet chestnut tree. Um, so Castagna sativa has many other names besides sweet chestnut including Marin, European chestnut, um, Spanish chestnut, Portuguese chestnut, and its Spanish name is Castaño, which is actually heard in English a lot too, just calling it the Castaño tree. Um, the tree is originally native to the Mediterranean, but naturalized populations occur um, throughout uh, northern Africa and northern parts of Europe and western Asia. Um, some sources claim that the tree originated in Eurasia over 90 million years ago, but the species that we're familiar with um, originated in Turkey a little bit more recently than that, and then that's where it was domesticated by humans, where it actually spread um, from from Turkey during the Roman Empire, um, for the use of its wood, actually, as a good source of timber. Um, the wood's a very strong and flexible wood, which is why it was so popular, and that's why the range actually extended so far into other parts of Europe. Pretty much anywhere where it could grow, it was grown. Um, and in modern times, we often think of chestnuts as like a, an ornamental item that you add to desserts and other things that's not that important, but actually, um, for European rural and mountainous populations, it's actually really crucial to their survival during times of famine. And um, for the past 2,000 years, it's actually been used medicinally for a wide range of uses that I'll go into later. And um, recent studies have shown that um, it demonstrates a wide range of medicinal properties, including um, antitoxic, uh, cardioprotective, anti-corm sensing, antispasmatic, anti-cancer, anthelmintic, and antibacterial activities. Um, so this is the tree. Um, it's a mid-sized tree, and it, its maximum height is about 40 meters, and it usually grows between 15 and 35 meters. Um, and then its trunk is usually a diameter of about 2 meters or a little bit less than that. As you can see here, the crown greatly expands um, across the um, width of the trunk. Um, here you can see there's leaves that usually grow between 5 to 9 centimeters in length. And um, its branches are tomatose, meaning that they lay on top of each other. And then you can see these yellow male catechins, um, which are, can also be androgynous. And then here are the female flowers, which are the things that surround the, the nut right there in the middle. I mean, they're spiny, spiny cupules, but they lack petals. And then um, the fruits are red-brown, and these are the parts of the plant that we're actually most familiar with. Um, so, as I said earlier, there's a wide range of traditional uses. Um, a wide, and there's a definitely a wide range of ethnomedical uses. Um, as I said earlier, um, it's been used since the Roman Empire, and during the time of Dioscorides, he recorded that the use of the tree, um, he recorded that the tree was used for its astringent and antitoxic properties. Um, a little bit later in the Middle Ages, um, chestnut seeds were actually used to treat um, cardiovascular problems. And then more recent ethnomedical studies have found a lot of uses, and um, including a decoction of the leaves used to treat um, respiratory problems like coughs, colds, and asthma, and that's used in many parts of the Mediterranean. Um, in southern and eastern Europe, the fruit is used for pain relief, inflammation, vascular disorders, and burns. And in southern Italy specifically, the leaves are applied to varicose veins to diminish swelling. And then in France, the leaves are used um, as a tea to treat diarrhea. And in Turkey, the honey is used actually as an antibacterial to cover wounds and other problems of the skin. And in the regions surrounding the Kopanoic Mountain um, in Serbia, uh, the fruit is actually added to a brandy, and that's actually used to treat coughing. So as you can see, there's really a lot of traditional uses, and they treat a very um, wide range of diseases. But in addition to these ethnomedical uses, there's a wide range of non-medical uses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the tree was so important um, as a source of nutrition to European populations that a lot of historians call certain areas of Europe um, chestnut civilizations, because they relied on these um, nuts so much during times of famine. Um, in modern times, chestnuts are often cooked, um, boiled, or fried to improve taste, and then they're added to things like cakes and pastries. Um, and then other items produced from chestnuts include flour, and then Corsican porridge and Corsican beer, actually. And um, the wood is also still used today because it's very hardy wood. And then parts of the tree are also used to tan hides due to a high tanning concentration. And um, the leaves are also used uh, to create dyes and shampoos. Um, since it's a pretty popularly consumed food, the actual chestnut fruit has been analyzed pretty well for its chemical constituents. Um, a little bit more than half of it um, was found to be water, and then about 40% carbohydrates, then with pretty low amounts of uh, protein and crude fat. Um, even though it has a really small amount of fat, it has really high amounts of polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids, which actually generally promote um, good health of the cardiovascular system and other parts of the body. 
Um, in addition to these high amounts of these beneficial lipids, there's um, pretty large amounts of antioxidant vitamins, which are vitamins E and C. And then a lot of the actual like chemical and medicinal properties are due to high phenolic contents, which are found in lactic acid and its derivatives, gallic acid and its derivatives, and other flavonoids. And in addition, there's a high tannin concentration, which is responsible for the tannin um, effect earlier described. And um, these chemicals are found in pretty different concentrations throughout different parts of the plant. So depending on where you get the extract from, you'll have pretty significant um, differences in activity. So as we saw earlier, there's really a wide range of traditional uses, and modern research has verified um, the efficacy of some of these, and also found new medicinal properties that weren't known earlier. Um, so, oh, sorry, and here's a list of um, chem uh, chemicals that are pretty common in a uh, spiny burr extract. And you can see yeah, very high amounts of um, alleged tannins and alleged acid derivatives. Um, so, probably the most analyzed activity is its antioxidant activity. There's probably dozens, there's dozens of articles on PubMed about its antioxidant activity. Um, the most, uh, several studies have confirmed that this antioxidant activity is due to the elimination of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. Um, in vitro studies in two types of rat cells determined that um, the extracts can demonstrate free radical scavenging, reducing power, hydrogen, peroxide scavenging, and nitric oxide scavenging. Um, and all of these contributed to improved cell survival, um, reduced DNA damage, and lowered activity of antioxidant enzymes. Some antioxidants work by increasing the activity of those enzymes. Um, so it's actually good that this lowers their activity so it gives them a break. So when they have more oxidative stress, they can respond better. Um, and in vivo studies done in pigs actually showed that it reduced oxidative stress in vivo in pigs, which means, um, which led to better health, health outcomes all the time, meaning that it actually can be used possibly as an in um, vivo antioxidant. Um, in addition to its antioxidant properties, it's also shown um, pretty promising cardioprotective activity um, by increasing the strength of the heart's contractions, which is positive inotropic effects, and decreasing the heart rate, which is negative chronotropic effects. And then at the same time, it also reduced the contraction of the heart cells when exposed to agents that would normally make those cells contract. So it actually um, protects the heart in a lot of distinct ways, but in a lot of ways that together actually really improve um, the heart the health of the heart. Um, additionally, it also has demonstrated creates a uh, significant quorum sensing inhibition. And quorum sensing, again, is the techniques bacteria is used to coordinate the release of toxins in the host so they can cause more damage more quickly. Um, and, so quorum, and so when you inhibit quorum sensing, you actually can inhibit the pathogenesis of the bacteria. And so these can maybe be used as the therapy or treatment for bacterial infections. Um, Antispasmodic activity has also been shown by Castani sativa. Um, on tissues of the digestive system, including the uh, guinea pig ileum and proximal colon tissues. And so these tissues were treated with spasmodic agents and then with the plant extract to show how much the plant extract would actually reduce their spasmodic response to these agents. And actually significantly reduced their response, meaning that these could actually be used to treat um, diarrhea, which actually corresponds to its use in France as a traditional medicine. Um, additionally, Castana sativa has demonstrated anti-cancer activity against three human cancer cell lines, including colon cancer, um, a prostate cancer, and glioblastoma cancer cells. Um, and the extracts showed um, definitely great potential to be developed into medicines because these are at pretty low concentrations, actually, so they definitely could be developed further to the, um, actually make a drug out of these. Um, additionally, it's also shown bactericidal activity up against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And um, it found that the active fractions containing these chemicals right here, and some of these chemicals actually on their own were very reactive, but none of them were reactive, um, as reactive as the chemicals were all combined in one fraction. Um, additionally, it's shown anthelmintic activity. And, um, anthelmintic activity refers to the expulsion of worms from, or parasitic worms from the body. Um, and in this particular study, it was found that the extract prevented the achievement or the transition from the final larval stage to the full parasitic stage of the worms. And so after exposing the um, worms to the extract for about 60 minutes, 100% of the sh um, achievement was prevented. Uh, there haven't really been many clinical studies on Castani sativa, really at all, um, except for its antioxidant activity. Um, one study tried to determine if um, Castani sativa could be used as a topical antioxidant um, in humans, and the study found that the extract first did not induce allergic reactions or contact dermatitis, dermatitis, meaning that it's probably safe. 
And then secondly, the extract did show pretty promising activity um, measured in two tests, the DPPH um, scavenging test and the iron chelating uh, test. Um, there weren't really many contraindications of uh, chestnut, um, but oral allergy, allergy syndrome is always a risk with um, chest, with any plant product really in general. Um, and additionally, um, the health effects of phenolic compounds aren't entirely known, especially in a plant which has such high concentrations of them. Um, further studies should probably be done to analyze what the actual effects of these compounds in higher concentrations could be if there's um, calls for increased consumption of these plants or of these compounds. And also, at the same time, um, cytotoxic and uh, therapeutic ranges are pretty close. A lot of medicines, I mean, a lot of studies found that 100 micrograms per milliliter of an extract was very effective, but then just above that is when um, cell cytotoxicity begins to increase too. So there's a very narrow range between therapeutic and toxic doses. Um, in terms of allopathic medicine, there isn't really anything, um, Chestnut is not really used in allopathic medicine at all, especially in the United States. And in terms of complementary and alternative medicine, um, in the United States, it's not really found either yet. Um, in Europe, um, as a continuation of traditional therapies, it's, I'm sure it's used, but there weren't any new novel ideas um, brought up in any um, articles that I read. Um, but I assume that they've continued using their traditional medicines, and that's a form of complementary and alternative medicine. Um, but one way it is used, actually, is that um, people who have celiac disease can um, use uh, chestnut to make a flour. Because people with CXDs cannot eat gluten, and so a lot of grains are off limits to them, so they can't eat certain breads and things like that. But since chestnut can be made into this um, gluten free flour, they can actually make bread from that. And then it's actually a pretty tasty alternative that's nutritious at the same time, so it's a pretty good alternative. So, in conclusion, um, due to its high um, reactivities and high amounts of you know, antioxidant and anti cancer properties, it's a pretty powerful medicinal food, and at the same time, a lot of its extracts have shown pretty promising potential as uh, pharmaceuticals that could be developed further. Thank you. Any questions?